welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're again live podcasting from our shell booth at the NMSDC National Conference and the Business Fair, which has been rocking and rolling since about 9 o'clock this morning. Um, many, many corporate booths, as well as some MBE booths, and a lot of networking, a lot of conversation, and a lot of business development and opportunity discussion going on here today. Well, what we want to take some time to do to right now is to give a little bit of an overview of the oil and gas supply chain. And let me a little bit of background on why we do this. One of the things that we have found over the years is that although the energy industry is one of the backbone, backbone industries um, in terms of the U.S. economy, and in fact increasingly so uh, over the last few years, there is still a fair amount of lack of knowledge about how this industry really works and what we buy, when we buy it, how and why we buy it, and as well as the kinds of things we don't buy, um, the kinds of things that, we, that may not offer much opportunity for uh, MBEs and WBEs. And so as we have um, worked more and more with MBEs across the country, as well as with our partners like NMSDC and the regional affiliates and, and, and chambers of commerce, one of the things we saw a need for was to be able to describe what is the energy supply chain, how does this business put together, and what do we buy at different points along that supply chain. So I'm going to do a, a, a review for you and um, talking about the main sections of the energy supply chain and hopefully it will be uh, educational and helpful for those who may not already be familiar. So for the energy industry, there we think about our, our business or our supply chain in three main major segments. There's the upstream business, there's the downstream business, and now increasingly there is a segment of business called the midstream. The upstream business covers everything from the point where we begin to look at a piece of geography, a piece of land, and begin to believe that there may be oil or gas in that land, where we begin to do the work and the analysis, the science to help us understand whether or not that's the case, to help us to understand if, it's, if those deposits of oil and gas might be um, economic, might be able to be produced safely, might be able to be produced environmentally safely. All the way from that point to the point where we actually do drill, where we find oil and gas and begin to produce it and bring it up out of the ground. That is the upstream piece of the business. So let me talk a little bit about that. It begins with the very first stage, which is the identify stage, identifying oil and gas. This is a, a phase where geologists and physicists and mathematici mathematicians and, and, yes, IT specialists work together under with extremely sophisticated technology. And with these systems, they are working to understand the structure of the Earth, which, by the way, we cannot literally see into and to try to identify and locate where the world's oil and gas reserves might be. In terms of technology, this piece of work is similar to going to the moon or to understanding what's on the bottom of the ocean. So here, here are some characteristics. Um, it's comparable, again, to, to space travel. It's very, very critical health, safety, security, and environmental expertise. Very critical. It's very internal and very confidential. So for every one of the major oil, oil and gas companies has its own proprietary technology about how they do that identification and how they do that exploration work. Um, and because we see this as a, as a very important competitive advantage, the company that can do the best job of finding oil and gas deposits and finding the most economically viable and safety and environmentally envi uh, a viable oil and gas deposits, that's the company who's, that's going to win in our industry. So it begins with that identify stage, then it moves on to the explore stage, and this is all still part of the upstream business. So once we've identified where oil, and reserve, oil reserves may be located, then we've got to do the exploration. 
Now here is where we start to make some major risk assessments um, in this stage. It's all about determining how confident are we that we will be successful in finding oil and gas in this particular reserve and weighing that against the risks and the potential losses. So at this point is where we would drill an exploratory well. So for those of you who have been keeping, keeping a track of our industry, drilling an exploratory well is something that we have just, we just were able to do in Alaska here over the last few weeks. Um, and as a result of that drilling, we actually decided to suspend further work in Alaska. It's all about weighing the benefits and understanding based on that exploratory well and what comes from that exploratory well, what, weighing those benefits against the potential risks of exploring for oil and gas in a particular area. So that risk assessment is very critical in that piece, in that piece of the business. But that's where we are finally getting to actual physical operations. So when you start physical operations, safety becomes absolutely paramount. That's also where we begin to put out large amounts of cash. We are now drilling holes. We're bringing all kinds of equipment and technology to bear. We're putting it on location in order to drill the first few holes. And that is where big cash flow starts to happen. So again, if the, in, the, in the case of Alaska, any, anyone who's been keeping up with that, the, the, the amount of equipment and the amount of personnel that had to be brought to bear to make that first exploratory well in Alaska was amazing. And the money that it takes to do that is amazing. Again, one of the, cap one of the issues or one of the, the characteristics of that piece of the, of the stage of our business is that there are very few supplier opportunities because this is managed very largely in-house and as again we see it as a, as a huge competitive advantage in terms of how well we are able to do that piece of business. So after we have, have drilled our first exploratory well and we've assessed the results if we believe that it's, it's worthwhile to go forward, then we are moving into the next phase which is the design and construct stage. So at this point if the exploratory well was a, was a success oil and gas has been found. Now we're designing and constructing the well to continue drilling. And the ultimate goal is to be ensure that the well is environmentally sound, that it's safe, and that it's efficient. And that's how we will ensure that we maximize the potential of that well. So it's a, the first really major operational step, step in the oil and gas supply chain. Um, so let's talk about, a little bit about the kinds of things that we are, we are buying in this phase, in the upstream phase. So we talked about identify, explore, and then design and construct. Key takeaways, again, the technology level is very sophisticated and highly proprietary. Um, we keep that technology very close to the vest. Very strong technical talent capabilities is critical to being successful and for us to be successful in this business. But here are some of the kinds of things that we do source um, in order to be able to carry out the um, exploration and production phase, the upstream phase of our business. Um, logistics, transportation, and housing, they become important. I talked again about Alaska and the amount of equipment and people that had to be brought to bear in order to drill that first exploratory well logistics to move all of the people and equipment there, transportation and housing. Um, in the offshore business, offshore facility services. So ha if we're talking about an offshore platform, that platform has to be maintained, it has to be managed, the, the, the people there have to be fed, um, food has to get there, other things have to be taken away and so forth. Um, engineering procurement and construction services. So you may have heard the term in our industry that a, a supplier, a major supplier, is an EPC. An EPC is typically a large construction firm that manages, like a project or as a project for us, a set of services that are concerned with engineering, a procurement, subcontracting, and actually constructing the facilities. Um, fabrication services of various types for the equipment that's needed in some of the upstream. Maintenance services. 
Electrical and instrumentation services, so again, thinking about an offshore platform, it's a huge uh, mechanical facility with lots of electrical equipment and lots of electrical and instrumentation that's required. Um, frac uh, hydraulic fracturing, what's commonly known as fracking services. So this is hydraulic fracturing is using water to break up and, and to be able to release oil and gas from reserves with greater efficiency and greater effectiveness. And rotating and static equipment. So if you think about some of these services that we buy at this point in the supply chain, um, you, can, you can clearly, I think, begin to identify that there may be some challenges for smaller businesses to be able to provide some of these kinds of services. And in many cases, they are uh, provided by larger companies. But, but our, our long-term uh, desire and the kind of, uh, of work that we're doing, development work and capacity building work that we're doing, working teamed with NMSDC, with HMSDC and the Southern Region MSDC, and our partners in these spaces is really aimed at helping to identify MBEs who may have some, some of the capabilities in these spaces and are ready and willing and able to work alongside with us to do the work to grow. That is for long-term viability of, of increasing inclusion for MBEs in our industry. This is the space that's going to be the toughest nut to crack, but it's also the space that's going to be the most important for us to make progress together because this is the space where the biggest spin and the most critical business activity is for companies like Shell. So that's the upstream piece of our supply chain. Next, let's move on to the midstream. So in the oil and gas supply chain, the midstream sector, and in many cases, um, up until the last few years, you didn't, perhaps didn't hear too many people talking about midstream. But midstream is becoming more and more important in our industry and especially becoming more important in part because of the growth in the shale oil, shale oil and gas um, part of our industry. So this is the piece where we have been finding more and more onshore as opposed to offshore, although offshore is still a very fast growing piece of our business, um, onshore deposits of oil and gas in shale which in many, in decades past, w would not have been economic, economically viable because we could not efficiently find them and bring them up. But new technology such as directional drilling, horizontal drilling, and hydraulic fracturing have made those deposits more economic and safe and environmentally friendly or environmentally sound. And that technology that then has allowed us to expand our onshore capability. So with onshore capability to find more oil and gas, now once you get it up out of the ground, we also need the capability to move oil and gas from, where the, from the wellhead to where it needs to go to be processed into gasoline that actually fuels automobiles and trucks and other fuels um, and to other products, oil, chemicals and plastics and other products that are all produced from oil and gas. So that midstream piece, that transportation from the wellhead to the, um, to the uh, development facilities, that is midstream. And that includes everything from rail, from pipelines, from trucking, from um, uh, uh, tankage, and all of those facilities that move massive amounts of oil and gas from the wellhead to the facilities. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, just some, some gee whiz numbers for you. Um, U.S. production reached $2.3 billion, billion barrels per year in 2012. In April of 2015, that production rate went up to 3.5 billion barrels per year. That is the highest that it has been since 1971. And that's due in large part, again, to the emergence of the shale industry. So this has transformed the global dynamics of the energy landscape. And one of the, one of the knock-on effects is that many industries and in the, is on many industries in the geopolitical realm. In the U.S., it has 
most recently over the last year, those abundant new supplies of oil and gas have, uh, along with other uh, issues that have happened in the global economy, such as the slowdown of chi in China and so forth, have meant that we have such abundant oil and gas that the prices have decreased. And that's been a real benefit to consumers in terms of gasoline prices coming down at the pump. But US, the U.S., because of the, 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 the um, uh, great increase in oil and gas that we have been able to produce domestically, has the potential to become not only energy sufficient, self-sufficient, but to become a net exporter of oil and gas within the next few years under the right conditions. So from 5, billion, 5 million barrels a day in 2008, U.S. crude oil production reached six and a half million dollar barrels per day in 2012, and now up to 9.7 million barrels per day by April 2015. So almost double from 2008 to 2015. All of that oil and gas that we have found needs to be moved. It needs to be transported over uh, various types of, of transportation and using various types of storage. So if you think about some of those things, um, transportation and storage then, of course, becomes one of the things that we're looking for. Um, if we think about the growth of the midstream sector, one of the things that Shell did uh, last year, last October, we, for the first time in our industry, we did an, uh, an initial public offering we spun off a public company in the midstream area. It's something that was we, we, we did, Shell did, it was the first time in the industry that a major oil company spun off an independent owned company, um, publicly owned company in the midstream space. And it was because the pipeline business and the midstream business is becoming so strong and so vital to continuing to allow the growth of the oil and gas industry. So it's during this production phase now where oil and gas is moving through the pipelines that um, oil production is continuing, we're drilling, we've got extraction and recovering from the oil from the ground. This is where our cash outflow really accelerates. So we're investing in pipelines, we're investing in, in, uh, in tankage, or we're working with others who are investing in pipelines and tankage. Um, Revenue generation is also starting now, though. So in the first part, in the first part of upstream, we've had, we're, we're putting money in the, into the gra ground, if you will, but until we get past exploration and we're now moving into production and we're taking gas and oil out and moving it down through pipelines and rail and so forth, now we begin to actually get some revenue. It can be many years from the time that we first begin to invest in, in exploration, invest in identifying and exploring and doing exploratory drilling until we actually begin to get flow of oil and gas that is moving through pipelines and tankage so that we, be, we begin to get cash flow. So that's one of the things that, that we ask, we believe that suppliers and we ask the American public also to get a better understanding of, that we can be investing for many years and uh, many hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars before we see any return. So the energy industry is a very long-term thinking industry. It's an industry that invests a lot up front in order to get long-term gains. And so that gives you a feel for how we approach our business mindset. Um, that doesn't mean we, every little piece of our business works that way, but that is the base of our business that generates the, the capability for a company like Shell to make money. And so long-term investment, that's also part of the reason why we're so risk averse, because if you think about it, we are, we are risking large amounts of money very upfront and without guarantees of return for sometimes many years later. And so that's a high risk business um, just in the base case. Along with that come the safety risks that have to be managed. Along with that come the environmental risks that have to be managed and have to be ameliorated as much as possible. And so given that we're inherently a high risk business, we then approach the business in a very conservative way. 
because our intent is to minimize, especially safely environmental risks, as much as humanly possible. So when you feel, when, you, when MBEs, I know one of the frustrations you, you may often feel is, boy, companies like Shell are so risk averse and they're so slow to move on some things. It's because we are in such a high risk business that we are looking to be pretty conservative in some other spaces. And so we ask you to understand that. So that's midstream. Um, some of the things that we actually look to buy in the midstream space. Um, so trucking services, barges and vessels, some of the things that need supply. Uh, railroad, transportation infrastructure of all types, including pipelines, uh, tanks for short-term storage, warehousing, main mechanical maintenance, and other kinds of logistical services. Some of the challenges that could be high barriers to entry for many transportation services. And that's one of the things, again, that we see as a challenge with, uh, for minority and women-owned businesses to get into these lines of, of supply and to get into them sustainably and to get into them with scale. And so it's, it's working with partners like NMSDC and with others we are looking to understand how we help MBEs not only get into these areas, but how we get them, help them to grow and sustain their businesses and reach scale. So that's the midstream business. So next, I want to talk a little bit about the downstream business. So upstream, that's about identifying, exploring, and getting the oil and gas up out of the ground. Midstream, that's about how we get it from point A to point B. And now we're gonna pick up the conversation for the downstream, which begins at point B. We've moved oil and gas out of the ground and we've gotten it now to processing facilities. The downstream sector is, co is commonly refers to the refining of petroleum and crude oil and to the processing and to the purifying of raw natural gas. And it also includes the marketing and the distribution of products that are delivered from crude oil and natural gas. Um, the refining stage is where crude oil is processed and refined and to, into useful products. It's where we get petroleum naphtha, gasoline, diesel fuel, asphalt base, heating oil, kerosene, liquefo liquefied petroleum gas, so all of these kinds of fuels. Um, so a few, a few stats for you. There are about 143 refineries in the U.S. of various sizes. Um, in 2012, U.S. refineries produced over 3.2 billion barrels of finished motor, motor gasoline. So refined fuel that is ready to be used, we've gone to, gone to the refinery, it's been processed into refined fuels. Those then need to be transported to terminals for distribution to get them to the gasoline stations. So the terminals are located closer to the transportation hubs for, for uh, gasoline and they're the final staging point for terminal for ethanols to be added, for ad other additives to be added to gasoline, and for the final refined product that you end up putting in your tank to get to the gas station. So at WG we have stat. Um, there uh, were 1,537 petroleum product terminals in the U.S. Um, a couple of years ago. So the terminals are typically owned by individual petroleum mar marketers, by either or by common carrier pipeline and terminal companies, or by integrated oil companies. And so we do own and operate some of our, our terminals as well. The terminal networks, they manage the flow of products to meet the demand, and they, they need to grow to keep pace with the industry. So the, the, the statistic that I said about going from five million dot barrels of per day of gasoline in 2008 to almost 10 million in April of 2015. Imagine all that additional gasoline, it's got to be moved. It's got to be moved through terminals and, and uh, um, for places for the, for the additives to be added so that we can get it finally to the gas station. So that, some people include that terminal network in the midstream area, but we typically think about it as being part of the downstream space. So once the refined fuel has had uh, ethanol, other additives put in it, and it leaves the terminal, then it's transported to the final point of sale, which of course includes uh, the gas stations and other areas, including uh, airpoints, um, truck uh, airports. 
trucking, shipping, delivery lines, they provide the final finished product that can be delivered across the country. Um, one thing that many companies, many suppliers may not know is that major integrated oil companies only own about two or three percent of the retail gas stations. Shell, we do not directly own the retail gas stations. We got out of the gas station business a few, some, some years back. Um, the vast majority of those branded stations are owned and operated by independent retailers who are licensed to represent the Shell brand. So we work with a licensed network of independent owned, independently owned retailers. Um, another GWIS stat, um, America's 180 retail service stations hold over 2 billion gallons of gasoline and diesel fuel at any given time. And a, a typical gas station has a storage capacity of somewhere between 30,000 and 40,000 gallons of gas. So in the, in the downstream space, here are a few key takeaways to, 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 take, uh, to take with, the, with you on the downstream. Um, U.S. refinery capacity is growing by expansion and it's growing by efficiencies. So one of the, one of the, the things that uh, has, you will see as you study the industry today is with the reduction in oil and gas prices, that has really um, impacted strongly our upstream business in, and it caused us to do some, again, some contracting and some reducing of our spend and reducing of our projects, slowing down projects in the upstream space. But in the downstream space, what that means is that the low pri lower prices of oil and gas fuels means that the upstream business is now more competitive and becoming more and more competitive globally. So the oil and gas business in the U.S. is, is fueling a potential renaissance in the downstream business. That's one of the reasons why companies like Shell uh, continue to be integrated oil and gas companies, why we continue to maintain an upstream and a downstream business as well as a growing midstream business. Some companies have separated upstream and downstream and made them independent companies, but we've stayed an integrated oil company. And one of the benefits for doing that is that we have, while we have seen once one end of our business perhaps to be impacted negatively by lower prices, the other end of our business has been impacted positively. And that's true, I think, across our industry that in the, in the downstream business, refinery and chemical production, um, across our industry, downstream is doing well, it's doing reasonably well, and it's growing by expansion and by efficiencies. Um, Refined fuels, again, are, refueling a, a, are fueling a manufacturing renaissance here in the U.S. And we're now starting to see manufacturing jobs begin to flow back into the U.S. based on, the, on the, our downstream businesses and the, the products and services that they provide to other businesses being more competitive. Health, safety, and environmental performance, again, extremely, extremely important extremely important in downstream, extremely important in midstream, as well as upstream. And industry experience, in this case, when we start talking about suppliers, because health, safety, and environmental performance is so critical, then industry experience and depth of experience for suppliers becomes extremely desired. Again, thinking back to what I said about us being a pretty conservative business because we're so inherently high risk. This is a space where performance of the suppliers, especially delivering in a refineries where safety is so critical, means that we really do lean towards suppliers that have depth of experience. Sometimes, again, that produces challenges for smaller companies and for NWBE companies. And it becomes a little bit of a chicken and an egg. How do you get deep experience in our industry unless someone gives you an opportunity to grow your experience in our industry? And we realize that that can be a challenge. And that's one reason also why we want to work more closely with suppliers in terms of capacity building and bringing our prime suppliers into the picture to help Find, find opportunities for MBEs to build and grow their experience and also still manage our risks. So some of the things that we buy in this space, in the downstream space, um, again, transportation and logistics, storage, those things still remain important. 
electrical and instrumentation uh, equipment and services, maintenance services, in this case hard service, hard, hard maintenance on things like pumps and electrical equipment and, and pipelines. Got to have lots of coatings and uh, maintenance of coatings to keep any corrosion down. Got to have strong insulation to keep loss of energy down. Um, technical and professional staffing becomes important in this space and fabrication tank construction and that not a not a net, uh, comprehensive list but to give you a feel for the kinds of things that are really core in the downstream space in terms of what we what we produce or what we need from suppliers so that's a, 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 a brief overview of the energy supply chain the upstream business about exploration and production the midstream business about moving our raw materials from the place where they're found to the place where they're refined into products that can be sold. And then the downstream business, which manages that refining of the products and the deliveries of those products to the final customers. So as we think about that, the, the, the final space that I want to talk about is so some of this, the ancillary services, the business services that surround all three of those pieces of the business, and they are corporate and central function type services. So there are a wide variety of those kinds of services that are needed to support the whole supply chain. And they cover everything from things like human resources and legal support, accounting and finance support, IT services, real estate services, and so forth. So in, the, in these spaces, the corporate and central functions, um, some, te some takeaways. There are very many capable, um, small minority and women-owned businesses that are operating in this function space. And companies that are uh, committed to supplier diversity are usually using quite a few MWBEs in these corporate services, and Shell is not an exception. We have a strong MWBE presence in many of these services. Um, these functions are sometimes viewed as cost centers and suppliers that can bring to the fore, to the customer, a clear picture of how they add value in something that otherwise we, other, we think of as just an expense, a cost of doing business. Those kind of suppliers can get really get our attention and help us to approach this space in a way that we understand that the supplier is adding value. Um, some of the, the kinds of services that we're talking about in this space, they include um, construction services, so building type construction services as opposed to uh, construction, the, the, you know, the engineered construction services for things like refineries and, and chem plants and so forth. Um, architectural services, IT and administrative support services, IT communications and equipment, storage and data services, records management. Um, human resource services of various types. Facility management services for soft facilities management and um, in our previous podcast with, uh, with Compass and Thompson, they are one of our key suppliers in that facilities management space for the software services. And real estate and brokerage services. So this gives you a feel for some of the things that are sort of more broad business services that support our entire corporation and they are very much the same as they might be for other types of companies. So with that in mind then, an overview of what our supply chain looks like, just some, some things to keep in mind about current issues and, and trends in our industry. Um, some of the challenges that not only that suppliers face, but that supplier diversity advocates face um, inside, the, inside companies. So large global contracts, um, I think not only for Shell, but for many in our industry and many in many industries, the trend has been to larger contracts, a more global approach um, to sourcing, and that can sometimes be a challenge, uh, bundling up larger contracts and be a challenge for making sure that we have inclusion of smaller and minority and women-owned businesses, not, which, not all of which are small, granted, but that can be a challenge for having inclusion uh, in our supply chain. Second tier, again, is becoming more and more critical, especially when it comes to, um, to supporting suppliers and getting their feet wet, getting their feet planted in the industry and building up their experience so that they can 
they can grow and move toward becoming first tier suppliers. Capacity building programs are on the rise. With all of those challenges in mind and understanding in our industry some of the particular challenges in terms of scale and, uh, and uh, capital and so forth and, and safety and environmental challenges, um, capacity building is becoming more and more important and Shell Supplier Diversity is spending more and more of our time and energy working with organizations like NMSDC and especially with our regional affiliates like the Houston Minority Council and the Louisiana Minority Council on identifying corporations that have some of the skill sets and capabilities and products and services that might be in our core of some of our growing areas where we spend lots of our cash and putting together capacity building programs specifically aimed at helping suppliers who have the potential develop their businesses and grow. And we have some really strong success stories that we have, have talked about in, in other venues on capacity building, but that's going to be in our, in our objective to grow our spend by 40% in two years and to sustain that growth capacity building is going to become more and more critical and we're spending more and more of our time and energy and our money in that space. And so while all of these trends are happening and then added, added to that, the, the, the cyclical nature of our business, it's, it's critical that capacity building over the long term to build strong suppliers with scale who are capable of withstanding the cyclical nature of our business is a, is a core thing that's going to be important for our work going forward. I, I talked in an earlier session about our 40% growth initiative and our, our commitment to be really transparent with suppliers as we meet them about some of the opportunities that exist and also some of the places where we don't have opportunities in the short to medium term. So I want to just share for those who are listening and who are not actually here what some of the, the current opportunity areas that we are, where we are looking for suppliers that provide some of these goods and services. This is, these are some of the things that we're looking for while we're here at NMSDC today. So oil and gas pipeline construction, especially in the Pennsylvania area, industrial roofing, process pipe fabrication, marine construction primarily in the Gulf Coast and occasionally in the East Coast, uh, diving services in the Gulf Coast, trading house consolidators, um, compressor and gas dryer preventative maintenance and repairs. Now this requires field service and plant air system surveys along with air leak detection capabilities um, such as on site at our facilities and, they, and we're looking for companies that are original equipment uh, manufacturers or are ISO certified. Um, Civil construction, especially in, in Pennsylvania. Offshore helicopter services. Um, going to marine vessels, transport of staff and contractors to and from offshore rigs, and they must be asset-based, not just service-based. So um, offshore, a couple more offshore areas. Offshore niche inspection, um, maintenance, rope asset inspection, construction support, working, for, working from ropes offshore crane maintenance, offshore rotating equipment aftermarket, so this is diesel engine maintenance and repair services, offshore maintenance and paint painting and blasting, um, other types of maintenance, lifting and hoisting, so hoists and chain falls and lifts, industrial elevator with inspection and maintenance services. A couple more, oil tank and construction and maintenance, um, some well services, directional drilling and drilling fluids, freight forwarding services, and some logistic services, in particular road transport of tanks and tankers. So those are the kinds of some of the things that we're looking for, we're on the lookout for. And so if you're listening and you have, you have a company that provides and works in some of these areas and provides some of these kinds of services, please come and see us at the booth. We are very interested in talking with you and we hope that this review of um, the oil and glass supply chain was helpful and is helping you to find your fit. And with that, we're going to take a very short break, about three minutes, and we'll, back, we'll be back online with our next session, which is an interview of a couple of, of, of uh, our peers, not in the energy industry, but in a couple of other industries who have been successful in growing and maintaining their supplier diversity programs to the level where they are, 
are um, spending at least a billion dollars per year with minority women-owned businesses and have joined the Billion Dollar Roundtable. So come back in just a couple of minutes for that session. Thank you.